Good day. This Veal Quality Assurance Train the Trainer webinar intended for industry professionals and representatives as they assist in the effort to certify veal growers in the industry for this in program. I'm Donna Menning, the Veal Quality Assurance Program Manager. The Veal Quality Assurance Program is funded by the Beef Checkoff and administered by the North American Meat Institute and we serve as a subcontractor in implementing the program to the veal industry. On today's webinar, I am joined by Dr. Sonia Arnold. She is the Manager of Nutrition and Research and Quality Control at Marcho Farms and Dr. Marissa Hake, a veterinarian for Strauss Veal Feeds. They are here on this program representing their professional expertise and not necessarily the direct advice and counsel of their companies that they work for. I thank them for joining us as well as their companies for supporting their efforts in being engaged in the Veal Quality Assurance Program. Let's start with just some general information uh, to ensure that everyone on the line and those who might listen to it afterwards have uh, the groundwork for understanding what is veal. All veal gets its start on a dairy farm. According to the 2017 data, there were approximately 9.3 million dairy cows in the U.S. So cows produce a calf each year. We know the heifers are raised and returned to the milking herd. As for bull calves, there are three options. They can be raised for beef where they're fed up to 12 to 1400 pounds. Of course, the majority of all dairy bull calves are raised for beef. And then we have the two options that would lead um, to veal, and that would be they can be sold directly from the dairy within a few days of slaughter and marketed uh, within a few days for slaughter and marketed at Bob Veal, or they can be raised for 20 to 22 weeks and marketed as milk fed or formula fed veal weighing around 500 pounds. The majority of all veal meat is coming from that milk fed formula fed veal calf. Um, in total, veal utilizes around 500,000 dairy bull calves annually that would have otherwise entered the beef chain. This slide here focuses on where veal production occurs in the United States, primarily the milk-fed veal based in Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and California. There are approximately 700 veal farm families on average each farm family raises around 200 calves a year with the milk-fed veal. And of course, we can have bob veal uh, throughout uh, the U.S., uh, wherever we have um, dairy farms. But veal in California is primarily bob veal, which is the bull calf that is marketed directly from the dairy farms. Where is veal consumed in the U.S.? On this slide, you can see some of those primary areas, New York Metro, Boston City Metro, the Washington DC area, in the Southeast in Florida, the Midwest in the Chicago area, and then of course on the West Coast. The leading processors of veal are also based in many of these primary areas, including Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. In 2017, a technical advisory group gathered to review the existing veal quality assurance program and certification requirements. They provided their input and the results were an updated VQA program that was made available in 2018. And now through additional checkoff funding, we are able to bring this webinar to you, the industry representatives here in 2018. 19. So my thanks for all the input of the individuals that you see here on the screen. The Veal Quality Assurance Program includes best management practices in the areas of animal health, feed and nutrition, housing and facilities, handling and transportation, and then overall management. All of the education and certification materials can be found online at vealfarm.com. Again, you can find all of the materials, a PowerPoint presentation, copies for the manual, and the exam are all located online. If you need a significant number of manuals, please contact me and we can have copies of the manuals distributed directly to you. I wanna recognize additional resources that are available 
through beefqualityassurance or bqa.org as well as the National Dairy Farm Program. So you can see those websites there and we would advise and recommend that for additional resources that industry representatives on this call as well as the veal growers that you work with that you look to these other respected organizations for additional information and guidance in how to care for dairy beef as well as those dairy calves. The goal of the veal quality assurance program is to inspire consumer trust and confidence in milk fed veal and to demonstrate the industry's ongoing commitment to producing safe, nutritious, humanely raised veal for veal, the veal industry and its customers. And history has been that we've had 90% participation from growers in the industry. We are always seeking to enhance and improve those numbers, um, and especially to reach out to independent growers to be a part of this program. So my thanks again for everybody who is online here today and the folks that you will interact with as a result. The Veal Quality Assurance Program does not tolerate abusive behavior toward animals. Any questionable behavior should be reported immediately to farm management and local authorities. Furthermore, the VQA program and its resource materials are intended for educational purposes only. This is not a legal document, any of the materials that have been created. Veal farmers are individually responsible for determining and complying with all requirements of local, state, and federal laws and regulations regarding animal care and production practices. The VQA program is based on guiding principles that were developed by the veal industry. Um, two specifically as they relate to VQA would be food safety and animal care. The principle being producing safe and nutritious food is our first priority and responsibility. And secondly, there on animal care, we have an ethical obligation to provide appropriate care for our animals at every stage of life. In chapter one of the Veal Quality Assurance Program, the components include, and I'm gonna refer, refer very top level about all of the um, requirements uh, to be VQA certified. And first and foremost would be to maintain a veterinarian client patient relationship and complete that form and then adhere to the best management practices outlined in each section of the VQA manual. There are additional recommendations within the manual, but it is the best management practices that are listed that need to be adhered to to be VQA certified. Another aspect of being VQA certified includes having a licensed veterinarian assess and provide documentation that the best management practices are being followed. And we uh, uh, are very appreciative to the role and value the role of that licensed veterinarian uh, to be engaged in this program and help provide that documentation uh, back to us as we do the record keeping on all those VQA certified. Additionally, veal growers should participate in a VQA educational presentation by an industry representative, like those that are on the call here today, and then document the completion of the training. The, those forms are provided. I'll highlight those in a moment. Um, now, participation in a VQA educational presentation can include that presentation right on the farm. So by no means does this mean there needs to be uh, a meeting where a number of growers attend and um, sit through the presentation and do the testing. Although that is most common, I do want uh, to help explain that this can also take place right on the farm. Program components and requirements also include continually reviewing these practices for ongoing improvement and innovation on the farm, and then recertification is required every three years, and that is a shift. Um, that was made when the updates were made. The program previously was every two years and now the certification is every three years. On this slide, you can see the documentation that needs to be submitted. This is all in the VQA manual. So submit A, B, and C. Um, that relates to that um, VCPR validation form, the best management practice assessment, and then, of course, we have documents that include 
um, name, address, and contact information. So print clearly, please. Complete them fully. That includes pages 41 through 46 in the manual and submit them to us. That includes the address here that you see on the slide, the VO Quality Assurance Program at 2900 Northeast Brook Tree Lane, Suite 200, Gladstone, Missouri. And we encourage you to make a couple of copies, retain a set, and then send one set uh, to us in Gladstone. So that uh, concludes uh, the upfront information I wanted to cover. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout the webinar, and so I encourage you to submit those questions, and I will be uh, sharing those with our speakers here in a moment, uh, Dr. Haik and Dr. Arnold. We're going to start things off with Dr. Haik as she walks through Chapter 2 on animal health, starting first and foremost with the importance of animal care on the dairy farm with the dairy calf. So now, Dr. Haik. So um, it's really important to understand that the veal industry is um, connected with the dairy industry. Um, so almost, you know, 99% of the animals entering into the veal industry are going to be dairy bull calves. Um, and so the success that they have um, in the in the veal side of things is really important of how they are treated on the dairy. So early calf health on the dairy really reflects how those calves are going to perform um, later on in life. You can advance it. Okay, I'm good to go. All right, so um, the beginning is animal health. Um, and one of the best management practices is to have a veterinarian identified with a valid BCPR. Um, and so the definition of a BCPR definitely um, differs based on state um, or group that you're involved with, but that needs to be a relationship where the producer can talk to the veterinarian, um, they can talk about prescriptions, they have withdrawals, they have that relationship in case something happens, um, you know, that, that veterinarian isn't located across the country or something like that, so. Okay, okay. yep. So with the valid BCPR defined here is that the veterinarian has assumed the responsibility for making the medical judgments. Um, there's significant knowledge of the animals by the veterinarian and the practice veterinarian is readily available. So the veterinarian should be um, understand that operator's farm, how they get animals, how long they have those animals, um, and be readily available if needed with diagnostic testing or things like that. Um, so another best management practice is to have the appropriate personnel um, that have been provided proper training um, and contact information for the veterinarian. Um, so a training manual, this should be developed by the employees as well as the veterinarian and have this kept on site. So we always find this really important, especially if farms have um, like relief feeders or different feeders for those animals that might be treating calves or something like that to have a proper manual and have that posted in the, on the farm. Um, all medications um, or other animal health um, products should be used on label um, and meet the requirements of the FDA. Treatment protocols should be in a notebook and kept on site, like I mentioned before. Everyone should have access to that record keeping um, and follows the label information and understands the methods of record keeping. So FDA label information on the bottle or container. Um, the bottle should have the name and the address of the veterinarian, the active ingredients of what the product is inside that bottle um, or bag, the species in which the drug is approved, diseases or conditions for which the drug is approved, directions for use, including dosage, frequency, route of administration, and how long the treatment should be administered. So that's very important um, to know if they need to do follow-up treatments. Um, the specified withdrawal time and expiration date for the product, and any cautions or warning by the veterinarian, um, and that's what's required by the FDA. We always add on there if there's anything specific to veal calves, that'd be added on the label as well. Administering of animal health care products, um, oral, so a drench, bolus, or pill, subcutaneous, which is labeled as sub-Q, SQ is beneath the hide on the skin of the neck only. Intramuscular is injected into the muscle of the neck only. Intravenous 
is given into the jugular vein on the neck, and topical is applied to the outside of the hide, usually along the back. So administering animal healthcare products. Um, this is just a good visual to um, show where a sub-Q administration is given or an IM administration is given. Um, I think the book talks about tenting the skin, so pulling up the skin of the neck and, and giving the injection there. Um, we tend to move away from that to not have a hand on the skin while giving the injection, um, but making sure you're giving it in the neck area underneath that sub-Q space. Okay. Definitions of prescription, extra label, veterinary feed directed medications. Extra, la extra label, as the name implies, is extra label, which means the veterinarian has been advised of using that medication in a way that is not specific on that label. Um, prescription drugs, drugs that are labeled with the statement, federal law restricts this drug to be used by or on the order of a licensed veterinarian. Um, and then the veterinary feed directive is a VFD drug that is intended for the use in animal feeds, and it can only be written by a veterinarian. FDA oversight, um, compared to other livestock species, um, there are, there's very limited use of um, animal healthcare products in, for veal calves. Um, so we need to be avoiding ones that say not for use um, in calves processed for veal. Um, and this is a time I like to mention that hormone implants um, are prohibited for use in veal calves, so they won't be using any of those. So another best management practice um, is to have a withdrawal table provided by the veterinarian that is clearly displayed and is used along with the labeled information on the product. Just like the, everything that was mentioned before that should be on the label of that medication, that should also probably be on the withdrawal table as well. Um, and this needs to be out, like I said, for any new relief feeder or any new feeders um, to be able to access at any time. Um, and at this point, we kind of mentioned that um, a, um, you know, we should create a culture on our farms that are for open communication. So if that an error has been made, um, that they can come forward and express that that happened and to make sure that we have a safe food supply. Um, all animals should be identified by ear tag, um, and this is necessary for properly recording the treatment of individual animals, um, which is required by law. Um, and also, if those calves are in individual pens, pen numbers should also be included. Um, documentation of herd health records is required by the FDA for two years after the marketing of group calves. Um, Keeping accurate records is required by law, and like I said, everything should be included as far as the date, what was given, how it was given, and um, any follow-up treatments as well. And those can be found in the documents at the back of the forms. So another best management practice is medications and other animal health care products should be obtained from a reputable supplier, properly stored, and disposed of according to direct label directions. So um, storage is really critical. So um, the number one reason for vaccine failure um, is actually mishandling. So the wrong temperature, it was left out in the sun, it was been mixed too long. So those are the reasons why most vaccines fail. So this is a very critical um, page to make sure that your producers are um, refrigerating their products right, uh, making sure that they have working refrigerators. Um, the thermometer should be kept in that refrigerator. Um, bottles should be sanitized on the top after they have been opened. Um, syringes that were used for modified live viral vaccines should be rinsed thoroughly and left to dry. Um, and they need to store animal health care products in a refrigerator, special cabinet, or a separate room other than um, a protected, in another protected area that can be locked as well. Um, the use, oops. Did I go too far, Donna? You're good. Okay. Am I still on the right slide? It felt like it went. No, you're good. Go okay. right ahead, Dr. Hayes. <laughs> the storage of animal health care products. Um, new or sanitized needle for each animal. Um, keep syringes and needles and other administration supplies in their individual wrappers until they are ready to be used. Um, syringes for modified live viral vaccines should be thoroughly rinsed with sterile water or saline 
after disinfecting to re remove any disinfectant. Um, and disposable needles and syringes are preferred, so they're not using um, cleaners or bleach on those syringes and then putting a vaccine to them. If they are using a cleaner, like this reiterates, they need to be rinsed before um, they're used again because it can deactivate those type of vaccines. Um, never leave needles or syringes in the bottles between uses and do not mix different um, products in the same syringe. So some do's and don'ts. Do immediately place needles and other sharps in a sharps disposable container. Do use an FDA cleared sharps disposal container. Do keep all sharps and sharp disposal containers out of the reach of children and pets. And do ask the manufacturer of your drug products if they can provide a sharp disposal container, because many of them will. So don't throw loose needles and other sharps into the trash. Don't flush needles or other sharps down the toilet. Don't put needles and other sharps in, re in your recycling bin. They are not recyclable. Do not try to remove, bend, break, or recap needles used by another person. Do not attempt to remove the needle without a needle clipper because the needle could fall off, fly off, or get lost, or injure someone. Okay, so um, a few pens in a designated area of the barn should be used to place sick or injured calves. Um, all calves should be checked carefully at least twice daily and preferably three or more times a day. So a veterinarian a diagnostic or a diagnostic laboratory can conduct tests on feces, urine, blood, or other appropriate tissues from sick animals to, in order to be identified. Um, so like we talked about before, having a valid BCPR with your vet, they should be able to conduct diagnostic tests for you. Um, and that is definitely critical to justify the use of some of the medications and vaccines that we use. So they should be ran routinely. Um, and especially to monitor the susceptibility of some of these antimicrobials that we are using. So this is a very important part. Um, we're working with high-risk dairy bull calves, and so this is something that should definitely be monitored. Um, in consultation with the veterinarian, veal farmers should establish on-farm protocols for monitoring and determining when euthanasia is the best option for sick or injured calves. Euthanasia guidelines, consult in your veterinarian to determine the options and guidelines for euthanizing animals in accordance with the practices outlined by the American Veterinary Medical Association and state law. Veterinarians routinely should be conducting extensive postmortem evaluations with pathogen identification to determine the cause of sickness or death and monitor the efficiency of treatments, like we spoke about before. Dr. Haig? Yes, ma'am. You just cut out on the last portion of that. Okay. All right, you're cutting out too, so maybe it's not just me. Am I cutting out now? Um, continue on, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Veterinarian routinely conducts an extensive postmortem evaluation. Um, like we spoke of before, they need to be sending in samples to identify the pathogens um, and determine what is causing those animals to get sick. Um, and this can help us justify what um, we should be treating these calves with. So guidelines for immunizations or vaccines. Um, the information provided here does not replace the advice of a veterinarian. It is intended to provide a better understanding of the benefits and shortcomings of vaccine programs. So this is definitely something that you need to establish with your vet. Each farm is different. Um, so in, in, it needs to work out for, for your farm so your veterinarian should be involved. Um, so the timing of these vaccines are important. In most cases, calves respond to viral vaccines if given within a few days to one week after the calf arrives on the farm. Okay. Is there any questions? So that that can, of yeah, that concludes the animal health component. Um, and I do have some questions here. Um, are feed grade antibiotics being used? And if so, how often? Yes, so um, with the change of the VSC, um, there are really no products on the market um, that can be used in veal calves. There is one OxyTet product um, that's a milk soluble oxytetracycline, um, but the production of that product is pretty limited. So really, um, there are none on the market that are labeled for veal. Um, another question, as a veterinarian that writes prescriptions for veal calves, can you speak to 
extended withdrawal times and what those might be prior to marketing? Yes. Um, so we are using drugs or medications that are proof for use in veal. Um, if we're doing any extra label, um, I always do, um, as personally as a veterinarian, I do extended withdrawal times. So I usually have about at least a 15 day buffer on those um, withdrawal times specifically for veal calves. Um, you talked about sick pens. Um, uh, I'm not, the question is, um, not sure about the use of tethers. Um, and is that ever appropriate? Uh, whereas the veal industry has um, made reference to tethers are no longer used. Yeah, they would not be appropriate in a sick calf. Um, situation either. Um, you know, all of our calves are raised without tethers. Um, and so if you're marketing your animals as such, they sh you should never see one on a farm. So not even in a, a sick calf situation would they be appropriate. Okay. Um, that is all I have at this time is if there are any other questions. I Reiterate, um, or we'll move on then to the next aspect of feed and nutrition. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you. We will hear more from Dr. Hake in a moment. So now I am going to um, pass controls here to Dr. Arnold. And she is going to be talking and speaking to the whole aspect of feed and nutrition. And uh, I know there's, we've already had some advanced questions about um, iron and other aspects there. Dr. Arnold, thank you. And, and Dr. Okay. Arnold, as you're getting set, um, if you haven't noticed already, you will always see in the upper right hand a corner page numbers that refer specifically to content within the manual itself. So if you are one that is going to be presenting and sharing this directly with veal growers, that relationship is there between the PowerPoint, the educational PowerPoint and the manual. And then periodically there are, are circles that refer to other page numbers that are documents that can be submitted. So the, the gray circle indicates page numbers within the manual. All right, thank you for allowing me to say that. And again, uh, submit questions and we will be addressing some of those topics with Dr. Arnold. So I'll hand things to you now. Okay, so if, I'm, I hope I'm coming through okay. If you do have any issues with the audio, just let us know in the chat and we'll try and get it figured out. Um, so I'm gonna talk most about the feed, the water, and the nutrition for the VLKF. Uh, and there's, to start out, just so we're all on the same page, there's three main types of feed that I'm gonna be covering. There's obviously the milk replacer, uh, and then um, and then uh, there's also what I'm gonna be referring to as a calf starter. That's a grain, some kind of grain mix. It usually has a pellet, might have some amount of forage in it, and, and water. There are additional supplements in addition to that that can be provided, but those are the main three. So to get started, it's always helpful to have a reputable nutrition expert who's providing the quality feed so to make, to make sure that the nutrition requirements of the veal calves are met and also to make sure we're not um, overshooting those requirements. There's no reason to feed excess amounts of energy or protein to the calves. When that is done, it's, it's no longer environmentally sustainable. So, so to hit the right balance, it is helpful to have some kind of nutrition expert who's helping you to balance your uh, the rations and the feeding program. So to talk about the calf starter, I'll start there. It should be a high quality starter, and by that I mean there should not be any mold on the on the grain mix. It should be clean. It should be fresh. It should be dry. Uh, to give a description of what these usually look like, like I said, it's usually a grain mixture. So corn is common. Oats are common. They may be whole grains. Sometimes they're ground. Sometimes they are cracked. Sometimes they are crimped, uh, rolled. They can be in various different forms. 
And then they'll usually be combined with some kind of a pellet. The pellet is made up of grain byproducts. Fish and bone meal or meat and bone meal are not are, are not allowed. They're prohibited by the FDA to be fed to, to veal calves. So the pellet should not include any meat or bone meal. But um, like distiller's grains are a common one. Corn gluten feed is a common one to include in that pellet. Uh, and, and that pellet also will carry the vitamins and minerals. Uh, so that the pelleting actually allows the vitamins and minerals to be evenly distributed so that no calf is having a toxicity while another calf has a deficiency. It just makes it easier to feed and make sure all of the requirements are met. The importance of the, the starter is really for developing, causing the rumen to develop in the calf. So milk replacer by itself will not lead to rumen development. The rumen is the first compartment of the of the ruminant stomach. It's a four compartment stomach. The rumen is the first one. The rumen is a very important part of the stomach in a mature cow. When the calf is first born, it really isn't very functional. It's the starter and the fermentation of those grains in the rumen that actually causes the tissue to develop. And the development of that tissue then makes the calf, allows the calf to extract nutrients from the grain and plant-based foods, as well as the milk replacer that is continuing to be fed. So it, may, it allows the calf to actually be a little bit more efficient than it would be otherwise. Uh, and another piece there too, I'll cover water a little bit more, but uh, as we go on, but water is also very important for that process. If the calf does not have water available to them, uh, they the fermentation doesn't doesn't really occur as it should, and it can cause a lot of gut issues in the calf if water is not available alongside this starter, because the starter is always going to be dry. So let me see if I can get this next slide. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the milk replacer. The milk replacer should be balanced. And when I'm talking about balanced here, I'm talking about protein and fat levels in the milk replacer. This will be different. The requirements for the calf will be different as the calf ages. The very young calf is putting on a lot of frame growth, a lot of muscle growth. The protein level for a young calf, and that would be like the first two to three months, should have higher protein and a lower fat level. Whereas as the calf gets older, the frame growth slows down a little, the muscle growth slows down a little. At that point, we actually want to reduce the amount of protein that, that's in the milk replacer and we can increase the amount of fat. That allows the calf to begin to deposit a little bit more um, adipose tissue and it doesn't overfeed protein. When we overfeed protein to the calf, that then causes the calf to have to get rid of the extra nitrogen that's in, in the body which is going to then come out in the urine and then it goes into the environment. It's First, it's not cost effective and it's not environmentally sustainable either. So as the calf gets older, we really want to decrease the amount of protein. We don't want to overfeed it and allows us to feed uh, a little bit higher fat and get good, um, good marbling in the meat that we're looking for as an end product. The feed should be mixed well and distributed well in the mi whatever mixing equipment you're using usually it's some kind of a tank that has a paddle mixer so that it can mix thoroughly and it gets the milk replacer powder is completely mixed in the liquid it should also facilitate easy and thorough cleaning and sanitizing um, so it should be every time you mix the milk replacer and most calves are fed twice a day uh, occasionally you'll see veal calves that are fed three times a day but regardless after every feeding the, all of the mixing equipment, all the distributing equipment, whether it's a hose or, or buckets, however it's being fed, bottles, should be completely clean. And the best, the best stepwise way to do this is the equipment should first be rinsed with a warm water. That, and by warm, I mean something that's comfortable to the bare hand. If you measure it with a thermometer, it's usually 95 to 100 degrees or 105 degrees. After rinsing the equipment and removing any obvious debris, then it should be washed with a detergent that also has some bleach in it. And at this point, the water should be hot, higher than 120 degrees. And, uh, and the entire surface, as much as possible, should be scrubbed. If you're using a hose, then you should try to run the, run the detergent and bleach through it multiple times, not just once. 
After that, it can then be rinsed with a sanitizer or an acid rinse that lowers the pH and pre prevents bacterial growth on the surface of the equipment, and it should be allowed to dry completely before the next use. So if you're using buckets, the buckets should not be stacked in, inside of each other until they are completely dried to give them a chance to dry completely and prevent any type of bacterial growth. Uh, and the reason why that initial rinse should be lukewarm, if you use very hot water to rinse initially, you're going to essentially bake the milk solids that are left, anything that's left in the equipment, onto the side. It'll become very, very difficult to clean. So a lukewarm rinse is the best uh, for for that first initial rinse, and then you can scrub with hot water after that. Um, here we go. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about water. So the water should be that should be provided to the kids. It should be clean, fresh water available all times of the day. This is even true for very young kids. Most or many veal kids that come that are raised generally come from auction barns. Some of them may come from a, a some of them may come from an individual dairy farm. In that case, the calves are hopefully being well taken care of on that dairy farm, as Dr. Haig mentioned earlier about feeding colostrum and making sure that they're hydrated. If they're coming from an auction barn, on all likelihood, they haven't had anything to eat or drink in several hours. So it's very important to make sure those initial calves, those young calves, have some kind of electrolyte solution that's provided and water should be available so that they can rehydrate. After they've gotten rehydrated, then the water should be available and they should have good access to it so that they can stay hydrated. Um, many, of the, many of the issues or disease issues we see in calves when they're young are gut-related issues. Many times they're related to dehydration, and dehydration may actually be the thing that kills the calf. It may be completely unrelated to whatever bacterial or infection thing might, might be going on. So it's, water becomes very, very important to have available that allows the calf to regulate their own hydration and may prevent more costly treatments down the road. Uh, in addition to having the water, water available for them to drink, you also are going to need access to a reliable hot water supply. That's going to be necessary for appropriate feed mixing and equipment sanitation. The milk replacer should be mixed. Uh, at 110 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in order to get it all of the components dissolved and in solution So you need to make sure that when you have when you're going to feed the kids you have access to hot water and you know It's going to be there Go too far Okay um, Animal caretakers should be trained in calf care and nutritional requirements and feeding techniques. This includes uh, the use of esophageal tube feeders and any other feeding mechanisms. In some cases, calves might need to be bottle fed. They may need uh, what con can call a floating nipple, where the calves actually fed out of a bucket, but they have a floating nipple in there. It helps them to consume their feed uh, and make sure that it's it's bypassing the rumen through the esophageal groove and getting into the abomasum. That would be specifically for liquid feeds. Starter feeds, as I said, should go to the, the rumen. Uh, and this is also important for anybody if you have somebody who's coming in to feed calves, like the main caretaker is, uh, is ill or cannot feed the calves for some reason or is taking a, a day off, you need to make sure that whoever's coming in also knows how to how, how the calves are supposed to be fed, how the equipment is supposed to be clean, and all of these um, all of these best management practices we've discussed. And it's important also to maintain close communication with your feed representative. If you have a representative from uh, the company you work with, or uh, it's it's important to make sure that they know how the calves are progressing and any health complications that are going on, so that they can be of most help to the to the farmer. Okay, electrolytes. We talked about electrolytes immediately when the calf arrives. These are also going to be very important at, through the early times, early stages of the growth period, because the, any anything that would cause the calf to become dehydrated is going to then need electrolytes. Is going to be the first thing that you want to go to. Provide water in between feedings, as we mentioned. This is 
becomes more important if you're feeding a calf starter because the calf starter, as we mentioned, is a dry feed. So the calf is likely or should be able to drink about twice as much water as they are actually eating in poundage of the textured feed. They're going to need that for more for appropriate fermentation and to make sure that they stay hydrated eating this very dry feed. Carefully follow your manufacturer's instructions on water temperature for mixing the milk replacer with the water. I mentioned the 110 to 120 degrees when you're mixing. It's important when you're thinking about that temperature, the mixing temperature, to also consider where the powder is stored on the farm. If the milk replacer powder is in a coal area and the powder itself is, is, is say, 50 degrees, or in some cases, it might be even closer to 40 or 30 degrees, depending where it's stored. That means that the water that you're mixing it with has to be able to first heat up the, the powder that you're putting in it and also stay between the 110 and 120 degrees as it's mixing. When you're feeding it, it the milk replacer, it should be between 105 and 110 degrees in order. And that is important first for the calves' appetite so that they do drink it. They like they just like to drink warm milk, and in addition to that, it will help as far it will help that milk replacer to move through the gut as it as it is supposed to in a consistent pace. Anything that causes a backlog or a slowdown or a speed up in the in the passage of the feed through the gut is going has the potential to cause to cause disease in the veal calf because they're eating so so much of it. Really, consistency is key. It's key for all, all uh, well, dairy heifers as, as well as veal calves, but it's very consistent for veal calves because of the amounts that they're eating. Uh, when we're talking about group fed calves, and we'll talk about housing a little bit more here in a little bit, but if you have calves that are fed in groups and all veal calves are, are in groups of two or more, if they're fed in a trough where all of the calves are eating out of the same uh, container, it's important to make sure that there is sufficient space so that all of the calves can eat at the same time. That helps to make sure that the calves are all growing consistently. If there's not enough space, then there's always one or two calves that are going to be pushed aside and the larger calves are going to then be consuming more than the smaller calves. This is less important for starter feeds depending upon how they're fed. Starter feeds, it seems to work best by having the starter available throughout the 24-hour period. And in that case, the space requirement is not as important because the feed is there all the time. So they, the calves are able to take turns consuming the feed. If all the calves need to eat at the same time, then there must be space for them all to be there comfortably eating at the same time. Okay. Whenever feed is changed, and like I mentioned at the beginning, we're usually you're talking about at least one feed change going from a higher protein, lower fat, to a lower protein, higher fat. When that change occurs, the feed should be blended as you're mixing it in the, uh, the powder with the water. So you might, for some period of time, for six to 10 days at least, take, say, one bag of the, of, or some amount of the one the first feed and mix it with the water combined with another bag of, of the new feed. So you have some kind of in-between period as you're transitioning from the old feed to the new feed. Uh, nutritional supplements, we talk about amendments. Iron is a common one, selenium or vitamins. They're provided orally if they are needed and they're based on blood analysis and examination or recommendations by the feed representative uh, and in consultation with the veterinarian. Uh, it's very common for calves that are coming from an auction where they may or may not have received colostrum at the farm to need some amount of supplementation. Electrolytes, iron is another common one. Just to make sure that they have, they're starting at a good base. They're not starting deficient. So it's very, it's, it's a good practice to check, to check the calves within the first week or so to make sure that they're their iron levels and, and, and levels of other minerals and vitamins are where they should be starting off. After that, usually the, the supplements are provided at some base level to meet requirements in the milk replacer or the textured feed, but individuals may need additional supplementation, and that's usually determined by measuring it in the blood. 
Uh, does anybody, are there any other, any specific questions that I can answer at this point? Thank Before you, Dr. Housing? Arnold. Yeah, we'll be moving into housing in a moment. I do have uh, some questions here. Um, so, and you, and you did kind of touch on it and that had, that relates to how important is colostrum uh, for both heifer and bull calves and how does that impact um, when they come to the veal farm? You just kind of talked about it, but maybe you want to reiterate some more. That was a question that had come in. Colostrum is immensely important uh, for, for veal, well, for bull calves and for heifer calves. And for bull calves, especially if they're going into a veal barn, they usually are going through some kind of auction and then they're being transported for some, some amount of distance. So when they arrive at the veal farm, they're stressed anyway. If they haven't received colostrum, they're likely stressed and low on several nutrients that the calf will not receive unless they receive colostrum. Commonly, this is they, they likely don't have very much adipose tissue. They haven't consumed any, any type of fat, so their energy stores are low. Their iron levels are going to be low, and their levels of their fat-soluble vitamins will also be low. So they, if they don't receive colostrum, the veal calf's really starting out from a state of deficiency, which is why, which is why that they, they need to receive electrolytes right away. They may need, um, they may need addition, additional fat-soluble vitamins. If, if it's very cold and they're being transported, it's, it's a good practice to get milk replacer into them relatively quickly after they arrive within the first, within the first eight, eight hours at least. Uh, it's sometimes it's hard to feed it to them right away because you, they may need to calm down and they might not eat it right away. And if they do, it may upset their, their gut because it's been empty for several hours. So electrolytes is always a safe option to start with. But if it's very cold, they're going to need the energy and protein from the milk replacer. So they should get that feeding within the first 12 hours on the farm after, after they've had the electrolytes and they're, sort of, and, they're, and they're calming down and adjusting to their environment. But yeah, colostrum is very, very important. Um, here's a question um, asking you, Dr. Arnold, to speak more about non-special fed calves. What, what is meant by that and what do they receive? Non-special non fed. Yeah. The non-special fed would be likely there, those calves are receiving much more a heavier grain or a heavier solid feed diet compared to a milk replacer diet. So normally, normally in a special fed calf, they're they're receiving 50% or more of their diet is milk replacer the entire time uh, throughout the entire growth period. A non-special fed calf would be receiving less than 50% at some point. They may not even receive milk replacer at the end. At close, uh, well, as they get older, they may transition onto almost entirely solid feed. So that would be that diet is referred to as non-special fed because it's very similar to what the normal progression that you would see in a dairy heifer um, or or a an animal that's not being you know fed any differently. They sort of are just going through this transition onto more solid feeds. And then uh, somewhat related, how does what they're fed impact the color of the veal meat and are veal calves anemic? Okay, so what they are fed can, can influence the color of the meat. The reason it does that is because of the myoglobin level that is in the muscle. So myoglobin is a protein similar to hemoglobin. It binds iron. And myoglobin specifically is in the muscle to, because it, by binding iron, it then can hold oxygen. And it provides oxygen to the muscles. It's very, and, it, and it will become more, uh, will become, be there in higher concentrations if, in two instances. One, if iron is plentiful, it will become more, it will be there as, almost as a storage vessel for iron. Two, if, the animal is is doing a lot of what's called aerobic exercise. So a good example of this would be 
either traveling long distance across long distances or um, or if they're spending a lot of time running from predators in each case they're they're doing a lot of movement over extended period of time and that then will build the amount of myoglobin that is in the the muscle and that's what turns the muscle red now veal calves are not running away from predators and they don't have to travel for food but if we if they are fed a a, a high level of iron then the myoglobin will build up and cause the muscle to become red because because it can because the iron is available and so the body will just almost store it as as myoglobin in most cases we like to have a nice pink color to the meat because that's what because that's what veal is known for it allows the meat to also be a little bit more tender it distinguishes veal from beef and that doesn't mean that the calves are anemic it just means they don't have excess iron so the the iron level is monitored by taking blood samples. Iron is one of the only minerals that is easily monitored because it's very high concentration in the blood. The blood is the normal storage place for iron in the form of hemoglobin, which carries oxygen in the blood. So it's very easy for us to take blood samples from calves and then monitor the level of hemoglobin. And if the level of hemoglobin falls too low into what would be considered a deficiency stage, that's when it, that, that individual calf would then be treated with oral, either oral iron, or if they get very deficient, iron can also be injected under the, if the veterinarian recommends it, to bring that level of iron back up to where the, the need is met and the calf is no longer deficient. So veal calves are not iron deficient. They're just not fed excess iron. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all the questions, everyone. Those submitted ahead of time as well as online. Um, we're going to shift into housing and facilities and then wrap up with some additional best management practices. And both uh, Dr. Haik and Dr. Arnold will be um, engaged in this, in both of these topics. Uh, given the topic of, of iron and the role that the veterinarian plays as we move into this next section, Dr. Hake, anything else you would want to add to what Dr. Arnold has uh, uh, provided uh, great input on? But uh, anything else you would add from a veterinarian standpoint? Um, no, I do think that, um, you know, that's a very common question to ask if veal calves are anemic um, and then the public wants to know. So, the way that I usually explain that, which is a little different than Dr. Sonia's, is that these calves are fed, just like traditional veal calves are fed a high milk diet. Um, and so most of their nutrition is coming from milk, um, and milk is actually traditionally very low in iron. Um, and so that's why we see the paler color on, on veal calves. So but that's all I had to ask, add. All right, thank you so much. We have 30 minutes approximately remaining for this webinar. We'll continue to address uh, questions, but we're going to highlight um, housing and facilities right now. And as I hope, uh, obviously, those engaged directly in the veal industry know themselves, but for anyone else who is on the line, the milk-fed veal industry has seen significant changes in this area in terms of housing and facilities, most notably the move to raise calves in group pens. Uh, group housed calves must be strategically grouped to ensure they are housed with calves of similar size, age, and drinking habits, as um, both uh, Dr. Hake and Dr. Arnold have alluded to. Calves must also have access to that clean, fresh water. And so that individual monitoring especially becomes even more important to ensure maximum health and comfort for each animal as we think about the group housing scenario. So let's uh, walk into this section here now. And again, I'll be inviting Dr. Haig and Dr. Arnold to make comments as we move ahead. So most importantly, and especially this relates um, publicly as people inquire about group housing, the standard here is about having the space provided so calves can easily stand, stretch, lie down, turn around, groom naturally, and have visual contact with other calves. This is a best management practice. I'll, I'll ask um, Dr. Haig to comment a little bit more. People have uh, advanced questions, have asked about that specific size or space 
Um, so as you um, uh, reflect on what's on the slide here, Dr. Haig, do you want to answer that question about what is the exact size then um, and how, to, how that might vary? Are there some variances um, in different states as it relates to square footage per cap? Yeah, so the, VLQ, the VQA program doesn't have a set standard other than that the cabs should be able to, you know, stretch and lie down and turn around and groom naturally. Um, there are some states that have laws of at least by minimum. So Michigan and Ohio have a 14 square foot minimum. Um, that's a written minimum, but we know that's too small for calves um, to, you know, like we said, lie down and turn around naturally. Um, uh, there are some other states that have some standards that they are, I don't have veal raised there, so you have to check your own state. Um, and then California has a new specific law of 43 square foot um, per veal calf to calves raised and or sold in that state. So if you plan on shipping um, any of your veal to California, then those standards need to be met. Okay. And as you alluded to, some of those other state standards are smaller than what the best management practice would be in that they can stand, stretch, turn around, um, groom naturally and such. So can you speak more to the group pens? Um, what is regarded as a group pen and at what age? Um, the BQA best management practice is that they're moved um, to pens of two or more and that no calf is individually penned after 10 weeks. Yep, so that's what we, we define group housing as two or more calves. Um, in, in my opinion, not in, you know, what is on the VQA is anything over six to eight calves is probably too many in a group um, when you're feeding liquid milk. Um, and then um, as far as, yeah, having group housing, uh, making sure there's adequate um, bunk space to get up to either the trough or um, whatever they're feeding out of buckets. Um, and then also mentioning that calves should never be tethered. Um, so our veal calves are not castrated and they're also not dehorned. Um, so these calves are going to establish natural um, male behaviors. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're also providing good footing um, so we don't have any leg or feet or injuries as well. Okay, um, yeah. And we'll. Thank you. Yeah, the, we'll get to some of the flooring um, uh, best management practices as well. Um, uh, ventilation, the facility is well ventilated, that there's protocols in place to minimize airborne particles. Um, all classes of calves are provided with reasonable protection from heat and cold. We have some more specifics on temperature. That was a question that had come up, uh, been submitted. Uh, that really relates to transportation, but it's also very important as it relates to in the buildings themselves. I'm going to let the two of you talk to that in just a moment when I uh, get to that slide. Um, both of you have, um, whether it's uh, keeping pens routinely cleaned or actually the the feeding equipment, cleanliness is really important as it comes uh, to the health and safety of the calves. Um, I'll just ask for both of you to speak to that as you see uh, the best management practices on the slides here. Dr. Haig, would you like to begin yeah. uh, in terms of the, the actual pens? Yeah, um, so pens are routinely cleaned. Um, resting areas provide cushion, warmth, dryness, and traction at all times. Um, all housing elements, including floors, fans, waters, gates, and fences, are consistently monitored and in good repair. Um, the plan is in place for managing and eliminating pests, and visitor control is established. Employees are trained at times um, following visitor procedures. And just to touch on that third bullet for managing and eliminating pests, one, uh, one thing to also pay attention to for anybody who is spending time on veal, veal farms and trying to help growers with these things, make sure that the feed is stored in such a way that you're not attracting pests. Any bags that are any bags that you have on hand should be sealed if they're not being currently used. If there's holes in the bags, they should be taped up. Uh, if you have some kind of cart or feed cart that you use, it should have a cover on it. You shouldn't have feed lay a mess of feed on the on the floor at any point. 
things like that will really help to to manage those pests and help to keep them out of the barn to begin with. Once they're in, it's going to be once they're inside the barn, it's going to be much more difficult to get rid of them. Yep, and keeping things like keeping good flooring and that keeps animals clean and keeping gates in repair. Um, producers always need to remember that they're making a food product and that food product needs to, you know, be clean and, and free of bruises when it goes to market. I have, uh, thank you. I've, I've moved on to some of the additional guidelines um, that do relate back to not only, you know, cleanliness for the calf, but the comfort of the calf. Um, we see a lot of this flooring in the picture here being utilized throughout the industry. Um, what other type, speak to this flooring as well as what other types of flooring might be acceptable? Um, yeah, so this is what we, we call tenderfoot flooring um, is, is the brand, but there's some other different brands out there as well. It's a coated flooring. Um, it tends to have really good traction for the calves, it's comfortable. Um, we don't see feet and leg lesions on it. And also keeps the animals very clean. Um, so like, as you can see here, this picture of these calves, um, this is what they look like all the way out when they go to market. So um, this flooring is being utilized in our, our veal calf barns. We tend to like it more than a concrete or wood flooring. This has already been mentioned about having uh, an area for sick or injured animals. So I'm gonna move on to that um, as we've uh, addressed that elsewhere. We had a question about temperature. Um, and again, I think that related more to transportation later on. Um, but uh, Dr. Haig, could you speak to that about ideal temperature uh, for calves? Yep. Um, when calves are moving into veal barns, into a barn that does not provide supplemental um, bedding, they need to make sure that that barn is heated. So um, our recommendations are about 65 to 70 degrees to get that barn warmed up when those calves move in. And then weekly that that temperature drops as those calves um, get bigger and they, they put on fat and they start to make their own um, heat. So that's kind of the starting temperature for those calves coming in when they don't have any bedding. Okay. And then we are going to, I'm going to move to the handling and transportation best management practices. And there are um, aspects to this that relate to both calf care as well as um, calf uh, nutrition and such. Um, so the best management practices here, calves are to be moved to their destination by walking them or lifting them safely and efficiently. We also want to make sure that there are transportation plans that have been developed, documented, and implemented to eliminate any of the distress, dehydration, and interruptions in routine feeding, physical exertion, exposure, exposure to pathogens, and stress from other weather changes. So Dr. Haik and Dr. Arnold, would you like to speak to that a bit further? Um, I, you know, I think I should follow typical BQA guidelines on moving and transportation of cattle using their natural um, movement. Um, the only other thing is to mention is that veal calves can be a little bit more temperature sensitive, um, especially when they are, you know, moving when they're older or younger. Um, so making sure there's adequate bedding um, and that the, the trailers are set up for those type of calves. Mm -hmm. uh, and are there right and wrong ways to how you go about moving and lifting them safely uh, from the barn to the trailers uh, for transporting? Um, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. We don't use any hot shots in calves under 300 pounds, um, and they're not used as a um, main mode of transportation. It's only when there um, a safety issue arises that one needs to be used. Um, so, you know, areas that are non-slip, using uh, sides, solid-sided um, gates and things like that definitely help. Um, on little calves, they don't have a flight zone like a normal um, older animal, so you can't use the same type of um, movement on baby calves. So a lot of those will involve um, carrying um, if needed. Uh, like on this slide, the movement of calves on sorting and moving from any pen, um, they should never be dragged, pulled, thrown, caught by the ears, um, neck and limbs, or tail or other extremities. Um, and caretakers should probably 
should be properly trained in safe and efficient animal handling um, and the consequence for startling those animals. Um, producers should always ensure the least amount of prodding is used when moving animals. Um, the use of flags, plastic paddles, and stick with a ribbon attached are appropriate for stimulating animals to move, slow down, stop, or turn. However, no equipment should be used as a weapon. Um, any force used on animals must be applied quietly, calmly, and with sound logic that provides for a productive and safe outcome. I don't know if you have any more about it. You had mentioned the flight zone. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry, I interrupted. Um, you had, but go ahead. Um, you had uh, addressed this a bit as it relates to calves. Yeah. Um, so like I said, on baby calves, they will not have a flight zone like they will in older calves. Um, but using this standard um, position to move calves out of a flight zone is the, is the best way um, to move them in and out of pens and out of trailers. We've already addressed some of the um, reference to the uh, significance of the flooring, um, about making sure that caretakers are trained. You will find when you utilize the educational deck, um, there is, you know, there is some repetition in content, um, but it's important that all the details are covered when you present and review this with your veal growers and or the veal growers also have some of their employees to include it as well. So I know that uh, when it comes to livestock handling and transportation, there's also important um, nutrition aspects. We're going to get to that with Dr. Arnold. Uh, Dr. Hake has already mentioned the significance of temperature and how sensitive calves are, um, that we should make sure that we take steps uh, to eliminate any of that distress. And um, let's talk, uh, Dr. Arnold, a bit more about that whole, you know, the interruption that will occur as it relates to feeding um, and uh, how we how we assess what we feed when we feed. So I'll let you I'll let you speak to that as I bring that slide up. Okay. Yeah. So we talked. I talked in, uh, earlier about the the importance of electrolytes. This is a especially important in the very young calves when they first arrive, um, but it's also important in the older calf that's either going to, uh, whether it's going to a finishing location or if it's going to uh, to the slaughterhouse or the packing plant. Um, it's important to make sure that they have electrolytes, perhaps dextrose and definitely water before transportation, but you don't want to feed a full feeding of milk uh, or, or have starter available right before they ship that's going to increase the likelihood that you have uh, DOAs simply because they're traveling on a full stomach and if they're severe, they're stressed and then they have, um, that upsets the gut and that can cause, uh, that can cause clostridial bloat or any other type of bacterial disease uh, because you have all those nutrients in the gut and cause problems during transportation or upon arrival. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was moving your slides there uh, a bit as I was double checking for additional questions. So um, there, there is, as Dr. Hake mentioned, um, uh, the BQA guidelines regarding transportation that we highly re recommend that people reference as well. Uh, when it comes to transportation guidelines, there's uh, some wonderful best management practices that should be referenced when it comes to the transportation of veal calves. So let's move ahead um, uh, to finish up uh, our presentation here. Um, there's some additional details that relate to the uh, transportation vehicle itself. And that we recommend that veal farmers be very familiar with the actual drivers. Managers should check the truck as well prior to loading to assure proper safety of all the calves. Ultimately, that farmer has that responsibility as they, as they take that next step 
related to transportation. Make sure that you develop and follow a documented disease prevention protocol and document those loading and unloading times specifically with your driver and coordinate those times with the processing facility. So any other questions uh, related to handling and transportation of calves? There's a question just for clarity on non-ambulatory animals at the point of arriving at the uh, processing facility. Uh, Dr. Haik, would you want to speak to that? What are what the current regulations are for that? Um, yes, yeah, so the best of my knowledge, um, with non-ambulatory veal calves, they will be considered a condemned um, at slaughter. So if they're down on the trailer they will be automatically condemned they no longer will bring them in and let them warm up and get them back on their feet That's all okay about. thank you yeah all right thanks we have uh, 15 minutes remaining and i'm going to just highlight some additional uh, overall best management practices that conclude um, the VQA manual that's within the program, and many of these are reinforce what may have been said earlier uh, in terms of, you can see this on the slide, uh, the overall management, again, make sure that you have that signed and valid veterinary client, veterinarian client patient relationship agreement. Um, make sure that you develop and follow a herd health plan that uh, you encourage open and ethical communication with your sources of bull calves, veterinarian, your nutritionist or feed representative, hauler and packer. So these are best management practices to underscore with the veal growers that you work with. Also to participate, provide and all ongoing education to animal care providers so that everyone engaged in the farm has that ongoing education opportunity. Uh, Dr. Hake spoke to the, the identification of all animals and maintaining those accurate records. Um, Dr. Hake, could you speak a bit about traceability within the veal industry um, as that uh, as this best management practice relates to that and the importance of that? Um, you, yeah, so having the ability to be able to track those calves from the dairy of origin um, all the way through the system is something that's very important, um, especially for early on calf health. Um, if, if you're having, you know, you need to have a relationship with where you're getting your animals sourced from. So if you're continuously getting animals um, that are low on colostrum or, you know, having early death loss, um, that affects the health and care that you can give those animals. So um, making sure that you have that relationship so that you can identify those calves and um, track them all the way through. This is something that we're moving towards as an industry. Um, packers are, are asking for it, and so are consumers. Um, so it's something if you, if you don't have implemented that you, you should in the future. All right, thank you. And again, um, moving through some of the rest of these overall best management practices, um, create and follow protocols for handling, transportation, feeding, sanitation, animal health. Um, we've addressed all of these things uh, earlier uh, with Dr. Hake and Dr. Arnold. Um, never market a sick, injured, or non-ambulatory animal. Identify all emergency contact information. This is critical as well. Make sure that's posted and is easily accessible, um, not only to the farmer, but any other employees. Uh, comply with all uh, uh, federal, state, and local statutes, rules, and regulations. Maintain effective waste management systems. Those can be county, local, and um, state-specific, as well as federal. Most milk-fed veal farms are raising about 200 animals. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that that waste management system is being, um, it does meet all of the state, local, and federal requirements. And then practice positive neighbor relations within the community and ensure that all neighbors know what it is, um, be be uh, 
proactive in your communication efforts to help them understand how veal calves are being raised and what it is you're doing on your farm. So with that, Dr. Haik and Dr. Arnold, anything else that you would just um, like to underscore when it comes to, again, the, the highest standards of animal care for veal calves, as well as the overall health and nutrition that they're receiving that you would like to add at this point? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna double check for any other questions. But if you could both just um, reiterate anything else you'd like to add. Um, I think, you know, for veal calves, um, they provide us with all of our livelihoods and return. They deserve our care 24-7, 365. Um, it's, our, it's our job to take care of these animals and, and be their voice um, and always have their best interest in mind. So reiterating that with producers and that they are producing a product that goes for consumption. Um, is, is very important. So that's all I have on that. And I would just add, when you're talking about feeding the calves and you're talking about the, um, the, the feeding protocols, I think one of the biggest things that you can do to help yourself on the farm is to make sure that everything is consistent, that the water temperature when you're, feed, when you're mixing is consistent, that the temperature you feed the calves is consistent, the time when you feed them is consistent, and and that you're using the good quality, good quality feeds and fresh, fresh starters and clean starters is uh, is going to save you a lot of headache down the road if you can just keep everything consistent for those calves up front. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Um, I do have one more question here. Um, uh, are producers, are veal growers, giving treatments to their calves on their own, or just the field rep? or I guess I would add, or just the veterinarian. So, um, no. uh, Dr. Haig? Yeah, um, no. So those individual animal um, feeders and growers, they are the, the main person that will be treating those calves. So that's why um, having good education and protocols and training with your feed reps and the growers is, is so important because really at the end of the day, the growers and the feeders, are the ones who are there looking at those calves every single day. They are the ones that are doing the treatment, um, and they are the ones that need this information more than anybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Um, I do not see any other questions, and I've double checked the list from those that were submitted in advance of the webinar. I want to draw your attention to my email there. If you have specific questions or in need of additional resources or would like to contact Dr. Arnold or Dr. Haig, um, you can uh, do that through me at Donna M at lookeast.com. Look East is a subcontractor to uh, the North American Meat Institute, who is the contractor for the Veal Quality Assurance Program funded by the Beef Checkoff. And I give my thanks to uh, their companies for allowing them to share their expertise on this webinar, Strauss Veal Feeds and Marshall Farms. Um, you can uh, find all the resources online at Veal farm.com and we appreciate um, all of your industry support and efforts out there to make the program available to veal growers. Um, we work directly with a number of companies in the industry that are integrated in terms of um, being engaged with the calves all the way uh, from the veal farm to the packing plant, but we especially want to ensure that we are also reaching independent veal growers out there um, to get their engagement and participation in the veal quality assurance certification program. So thank you all so much for joining. Thank you to Dr. Arnold and to Dr. Hake. And um, we will wrap up this webinar at this time for veal quality assurance. And thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.